Good morning. First of all, let me just begin by saying that there are two words that may seem incongruous, but go well together. Those words being agitation and appreciation. In the history of the NAACP, we have engaged unapologetically, unrelentingly in agitation, in moments of difficulty, in moments in which our lives have been threatened, in moments in which our livelihoods have been threatened, we have been fearless in our agitation. But we have also been unapologetic and unrelenting in our appreciation for one another. We love one another, we care for one another, we stand up for one another. And so I think that this symposium represents a moment in which we're seeing the best in agitation, the best in advocacy, the best in protest, demonstrated in our midst at our time. But I don't think that that is inconsistent with the notion of appreciating one another in terms of the diversity of opinion, diversity of perspective, diversity in generation. And so can I tell you, if I can just start off with a little anecdote, uh, when I was a student uh, at Yale, we organized a little protest and demonstration against the administration, uh, and the faculty was not entirely happy about this. In fact, uh, a great many of the faculty thought that we were uh, rather intemperate and uh, not particularly well-mannered. But the dean of Yale Law School uh, said to the faculty, well, you can't actually blame these students because you admitted them, you trained them, <laughs> you educated them, and they are in fact using their skills. Being a good advocate means speaking truth to power. It means speaking truth at inconvenient moments. And so we can't be afraid of advocacy. We can't be afraid of agitation. We can't be afraid of diversity of opinion. And so while applause was not necessary in terms of what was said, I might ask that we applaud at those who said it and the courage with which they said it. I was raised by a very Southern grandmother who taught me that when you come to an occasion like this, you begin with these two words, those words being thank you. I want to thank the panelists, thank the students for allowing me to be a part of this extraordinary occasion. I want to thank you as advocates uh, for allowing me to be a part of this day. I also want to thank the founder of the Princeton Prize, this Princeton Prize on Race Relations, Henry Von Cohorn, who is here. Thank you. <laughs> who many years ago had the uh, prophetic vision to lift up or create an occasion to lifting up uh, those who are advocates uh, for the advancement of race relations. And that is consistent with the lineage and the legacy of the NAACP. I want to thank my friend Mickey Fagan for extending to me this opportunity uh, to be here. This moment uh, is an extraordinary moment for me as president and CEO of the NAACP. And it is uh, an honor to stand in the midst of so many distinguished uh, advocates. Uh, may I share with you that I've not always been so fortunate to be in the midst of so many distinguished folks in such, or on such a distinguished campus. So may I share with you a little story. Uh, many years ago, as a student, I found myself in London, England on a Sunday morning. True story. I found myself standing outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral uh, in London. And as a young, naive, innocent, presumptuous seminary student, I thought that there were about 2,000 or so people inside of this cathedral waiting to hear this young, naive, presumptuous preacher preach. Now, I made my way into the sanctuary, true story, and I immediately noticed the obvious. The pastor and exactly two members. One member I called Ms. Jones, and the other member I called Ms. Smith. Now, I did as I was taught to do, which is to say that you preach, you share, you speak, 
to two people in the same way that you would to 2,000. Now, as I began to preach, I immediately noticed the obvious, that Ms. Jones immediately fell asleep. True story. <laughs> so this inspired me to speak with greater fervor and with greater conviction. And as I was speaking, I immediately noticed the obvious that Ms. Smith seemed to hang on to every word I had to say. She tapped her toes, she clapped her hands, she nodded her head, and in my theological tradition, she said amen and hallelujah. So I thought to myself, at least I'm reaching one somebody this Sunday morning. Well, I concluded my modest little homily, made my way out of the pulpit, made my way to the side of the pastor, and the pastor said to me, Brother Brooks, I'm just so sorry. Uh, Miss Jones falls asleep on everybody, and Miss Smith is out of her mind and did not understand the thing you had to say. <laughs> so you can see why I'm so delighted uh, to be at this symposium. Today represents an anguishing hour in our democracy, in which we look across the length and breadth of our nation, and we see a millennial generation of advocates who assert with their minds, their hearts, and their very bodies that black lives matter. They say so unapologetically with the understanding that when you assert that black lives matter, it is the ethical predicate to the moral conclusion that all lives matter. Unless the first is true, the second can never be true. This is a moment in our democracy where we look across this nation and we yet see a generation of advocates I have seen in places like Ferguson, in Cleveland, in North Charleston, in Staten Island, where advocates are saying in no uncertain terms that the life of Michael Brown mattered, the life of Sandra Bland mattered, the life of an Afro-angelic 12-year-old Tamir Rice mattered, the life of those whose lives and humanity cannot be encapsulated in a hashtag matter. It is a moment in our democracy where we see a generation of advocates who have faced down tear gas, who have faced down the hostile glares of police officers, who have faced down an attorney general not committed to the Constitution. It is a moment in our democracy where millennial activists are challenging premillennials by saying to them, you cannot outsource this Twitter age civil rights movement. Either you stand with us or stand aside, but you've got to stand up. It is a moment in our democracy where it is not sufficient to say, did I march with Martin Luther King? Did I knew Rosa Parks? Did I was a member of the NAACP? You must assert what you're doing now, what you're doing in our time, what you're doing in the midst of the injustices of our age. It is a moment where it is not sufficient to issue a press release, to tweet, to post. One must put one's body on the line. One must put one's heart on the line. One must stand up. One must step forward. One must literally confront the injustice of our age and our time. That is the moment that the NAACP finds itself in. I'm reminded of a political parable told by a Baptist preacher from Montgomery, Alabama, who was a member of the executive, executive committee of the Montgomery branch of the NAACP. He told a story about a man by the name of Rip Van Winkle who took a narcoleptic nap of two decades after going up on a mountain. When Rip Van Winkle went up the mountain, there was a sign with the name of King George on it. When he came down the mountain, there was a sign with the name of George Washington on it. Rip Van Winkle slept through 
a revolution. But we have a generation of activists who have no intention of sleeping through a revolution. They understand that the moment that we're in is not a moment of our founding fathers and our founding mothers. It is a moment in which we must speak to the nation. We must speak to the conscience of the country. We must speak up to ensure that we have a woke democracy, a conscious democracy, an aware democracy, a democracy that speaks to those who are being persecuted as a consequence of race, as a consequence of ethnicity, as a consequence of being members of the LGBTQ community, as a consequence of disability as a consequence of anything that divides and dehumanizes and demeans our humanity. This is a moment for a woke democracy. We have come through an election, a campaign in which we have seen racism routinize, anti-Semitism normalize, Islamophobia de-exceptionalize, and misogyny mainstream. We have seen in these recent days an office of legitimacy for the alt-right opened up in the West Wing of the White House. This is not a partisan observation, but when you have someone who has made money built into the business model, racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and misogyny, exalted into a position of honor and respect and influence in the White House, when you have the architect of the Breitbart alt-right platform in the White House, it is a moment where we have to call it for what it is, and it is wrong. There are three areas in which we see millennial activists leading the way. Criminal justice reform, voting rights, and in the realm of combating hate crime. Consider this. In the most recent year of the FBI survey on hate crimes, we've seen hate crimes against African Americans go up significantly, well over 5% against Jews quite significantly, well over 6%. Against Muslims, 67%. Since election day, there have been over 1,000 hate crimes in this country, committed not in streets in the main, not in bars in the main, but in our K through 12 schools, the same schools you go to since election day. This is a moment in our democracy where so many feel as though their skin is a sin. So many feel that their orientation is an indictment. So many feel that their ethnicity is a curse because our fellow citizens have lost their hearts and their minds. But we have seen, we yet see in this room at our time, in this moment, students who are starting their own organizations, their own urban leagues, their own NAACPs, their own Black Lives Matter movements in their schools. Why? Because you understand that hate is something we hate and love is something we embrace and we know that love trumps hate. But we have to be very clear about the opposition that we face. We cannot confront anti-Sism, racism, Islamophobia, the hatred of people who are gay or lesbian, the disdain that people in, the, in, the, in those who have disabilities face on a day in and day out, standing in our separate corners working in our silos of isolation. This is a moment where we have to build broad base coalitions based on conscience, not on a consensus of opinion. We don't have to agree all the time and at every moment in order to work together. But we have to be committed to working together. 
May I speak honestly with you? What happens when you get hate mail at your house? Hate mail online. Death threats in person and death threats delivered via the FBI. What happens when your children wonder and ask you, Daddy, is this, is, is this job safe? Well, I can tell you, you find some sustenance, some soul sustenance. You find some courage. You find some guts when you talk to young activists who say, we're standing in the gap. We're standing against hate. We're standing against racism. We're standing against anti-Semitism. And we are not intimidated. In my work, I'm encouraged when I look not over my shoulder, but at my side, and I see activists who are not afraid, who do not accept the status quo as the status quo. They accept it as a temporary condition ready to be changed. But we got to be clear. We cannot underestimate what is happening in this country. Some dismiss this as a college prank, locker room banter. Some dis dismiss this moment as, as, as a, a matter of those subscribing to political correctness being overly sensitive. You cannot be overly sensitive to the demeaning and the dehumanization humanization of your fellow citizens. When on President's Day, we had Jewish community centers across the country subject to bomb threats. We had children having to be evacuated from their schools as their parents had to explain to ethically confused and morally befuddled children why they're having to leave school because their fellow citizens subscribe to a philosophy of hate. But can I tell you, the NAACP, we're real clear on our mission. We stand against hate day in and day out. We don't care if you like our position. We're not particularly influenced by uh, the Gallup polls as to our popularity. We stand against hate. And we stand, it's not an organization that's 108 years old, though we are. We stand as the largest civil rights organization for young people in this country, bar none. We have more young people in the NAACP committed to civil rights and social justice than any organization in the country. That is 2,200 units in every large city in the country, hundreds and hundreds of small towns, in high schools, colleges, Native American reservations, 60 military installations, five abroad, and units as small as 50 and as large as 10,000. And in all of those organizations, we have young people pressing the case. 10% of our board seats are reserved for those who are in college. That's not a record met by any bank, not a record not met by any, any foundation, or record not met by any organization in the country. Why? Because we understand that you cannot have a movement conducted by everybody on Social Security. <laughs> That's where we are. We need a multi-generational civil rights movement in the realm of criminal justice reform. May I remind you that we have 2.2 million Americans behind bars, 1 million fathers behind bars, 70 million Americans with a criminal record, a generation of young people who've grown up without their mothers and fathers because they've been locked away as a consequence of three strikes and your outlaws. The NAACP has stood against this era of mass incarceration, this infrastructure of exclusion that says if you have a criminal record, you have been sentenced to a lifetime of unemployment. And we have been joined in that fight by young activists here in New Jersey. Only a few years ago, we passed a ban the box law. Yes, we had senior members of the NAACP, but can I tell you, we had students from Rutgers, students from Princeton, who led the fight to ensure that people with criminal records have the opportunity to work. Are you familiar with this law? Are you familiar with the practice of when you apply for a job? There's a millimeter wide box that asks, have you ever been arrested or convicted of a crime? Check this box, and when you do so, it 
ensures that you will not be employed. Here in New Jersey, we passed that law with literally 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds testifying in the legislature, standing up, doing their own press conferences, placing articles and op op opinion pieces in the Washington Post and in the nation. Advocacy works, and multi-generational advocacy works best. Can I tell you a story about why we feel that this is so important? Only a few years ago, in Alabama, a law enforcement officer looking through a dusty box came upon two photographs, two sepia tone pictures of yesteryear, two black and white photographs of a time gone by. One picture depicted a middle-aged woman with a shy demeanor masking a fierce sense of determination. The other picture depicted a young man with a precocious sense of moral maturity and a ministerial bearing. And yet the picture of the middle-aged woman was scarred, defaced like the grime of graffiti on the wall with these numbers, 7053, 7053. The young man's picture was scarred with these numbers, 7089, 7089. Eight, nine. We don't know the middle-aged woman by the mugshot number. We don't know the middle-aged woman by the arrest number. We don't know the middle-aged woman by the number 7053. We know her by the name the school children in the world over call her Mrs. Rosa Louise Parks. We don't know the young man by his mugshot number, by his arrest number, by his criminal record number, 7089. We know him by his given name, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Everybody with a criminal record is not a crook. That's the moment where we're in. And we have young people all across the country who are saying to this criminal justice system, you cannot lock up everybody. We cannot have a brutally efficient school-to-prison pipeline that begins in preschool. I've seen it across the country. Young people, yes, calling their congressmen and congresswomen, calling their senators, challenging their governors, and standing against this criminal justice system that perpetuates so much injustice. Can I share with you a story? In Mobile, Alabama, over the holidays, we decided that the nomination of Senator Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, with his long legacy of standing against civil rights, was a step too far. And so we went to his office, stood in and sat in with college students from his office. And the head of my youth and college division said, you know what? President Brooks, we're going to put all this on Facebook Live. We're going to turn his office into a broadcast studio, a digital studio for our message of justice. So we sat in his office. Half a million people, check that out. 32 million on CNN's Twitter feed. The video went viral at at least a million views, and then it went global. And then as we were being cuffed and arrested, and taken to the Mobile Jail after an hour-long uh, ride in their rather uncomfortable police van, we, as a consequence of the advice of my uh, uh, college students, we put the mug shots online and then in the New York Times. Why? Because we wanted to send a message loud and clear. We are standing against this criminal injustice system. And we're standing as a multi-generational army of justice. We gotta have the grandparents and the grandchildren in the same movement. We cannot have a situation where older folks are saying, we've done our part, let them do their part. Well, dear God, our people are being locked up together. The grandparents, the parents, and the children. This is a moment where we've got to stand together. We cannot afford to stand in separate camps. You cannot have the Facebook crowd over here and the Instagram crowd over here. Everybody's got to stand together and stand against injustice and stand now. That's the moment that we're in. 
May I share with you? Thirdly, voting rights. We have seen in the wake of the Shelby versus Holder Supreme Court decision that came down only a few years ago, a Machiavellian frenzy of voter disenfranchisement. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is not old school voter suppression. This is not your grandparents' voter suppression from 1950. Black, white voter suppression. Yes, we saw that in Texas, where they passed a voter suppression law that said you had to have a government-issued photo ID that imperiled 630,000 voters. This is a new school, a neo-old school voter suppression, because in Texas they passed a law which said if you have an ID which allows you to carry a concealed weapon, it was deemed sufficient civic and democratic proof to vote. But an ID which allows you to carry a book of engineering, a book of English, a book of poetry, a book of Shakespeare, a college textbook, or a high school ID to be insufficient democratic and civic proof to vote. Wherever you see racial voter suppression, ethnic voter suppression, you see millennial voter suppression. But guess what? The NAACP, with our college activists, went to court and we won. We put 630,000 votes back on the ballot. <laughs> these rascals, these unconstitutional rascals, not content. Over in North Carolina, they passed an omnibus voter suppression law. Oh, yes, it made it hard for black folks to vote. Oh, yes, it made it hard for Latinos to vote. But guess what? It also infringed on the right to vote of young people. In North Carolina, they had pre-registration for 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds. They wiped that off the books. Not only that, they also passed a law which required a government-issued photo ID, an ID which allows you to walk across the campus of Camp Lejeune and Fort Bragg was deemed sufficient proof to vote. But an ID which allows you to walk across the campus of Princeton or North Carolina A&T on the University of North Carolina deemed to be insufficient proof to vote. But we went to court and we won there as well. In Alabama, the home of Senator Sessions. Take note of this. Anybody here? Anybody here tried to pass a driver's test? Tried to get your driver's license? Now, if you're from Alabama, there was one, one sister here from Alabama. Yes, your home state, please forgive me. <laughs> in your home state of Alabama, the legislature in its infinite wisdom passed a law requiring a government-issued photo ID. Then they decide to close the DMVs in the black counties. Then they reassured the people that we will provide mobile ID units, which became immobile on Super Tuesday. <laughs> We're still fighting in Alabama, still going to jail in Alabama, not giving up in Alabama. May I share with you, this is a moment where we need young activists to lead this fight. Let me give you an example of our resolve and your resolve. Two years ago, we announced a march from Selma, Alabama to Washington, DC, a journey that we called America's Journey for Justice of 1,002 miles over the course of 43 days. We began on a day at 103 degrees, pavement at 109 degrees, heat index at 113 degrees. We began with high school students, we began with college students, and we began marching beside a man whose chosen name was Middle Passage. Middle told me that he wanted to march with students to inspire a whole 
generation to stand up for the right to vote. Middle passage was 67 years of age, a veteran of the Navy, a veteran of the Vietnam War. Middle passage and I spent night after night talking about young people standing against police misconduct, standing against voter suppression, and standing up for their rights in this Twitter age civil rights movement. Middle passage told me that he wanted to carry the American flag from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. 900 miles into the journey, we came to a little place called Spotsylvania, Virginia. There were a group of students, high school students and elementary school students on the side of the road. We walked through a rainstorm, but when we got through the rainstorm, in which Middle kept the flag wrapped up. When the sun came out, when the blue sky emerged, when the clouds parted, Middle unfurled the American flag, and when he did so, he collapsed to the pavement. My hardest day at the NAACP was explaining to a group of students like yourselves, Middle didn't make it. Middle didn't come back from the hospital. Middle died. But the hardest question I've ever been asked at the NAACP was posed by those same students who asked, if a man was willing to die for the right to vote, why can't we vote and fight for the right to vote? <laughs> These students. We're not inclined to wait forever, not inclined to be patient, not inclined to give in, not inclined to give up, not inclined to give over. They were committed to voting rights in our time. You've not come to Princeton University to receive a piece of paper, a piece of parchment, an award. You've come here because you are part of a civil rights movement in your time. It's not about your grandparents' generation. It's not about your mom and daddy's generation. It is about your movement in your time, and this time is now. So if anybody wants to give an award, anybody wants to give a prize, anyone wants to give a certificate of accomplishment, let it be a certificate for courage. Let it be a certificate for creativity. Let it be a certificate for innovation. Let it be a certificate for determination. Let it be a certificate for what you're doing in your time, and it is now. This moment is real. When you go back to your schools, the hate, the misogyny, the anti-Semitism, the racism is likely to be there. But you go back, not by yourself, but with advocates like yourselves. And you go back in the lineage and in the legacy of the NAACP. You honor Rosa Parks. You honor Martin Luther King. You honor John Lewis. And you recall that John Lewis sat down in the well of the House as an elder statesman of Congress. But do you recall that John Lewis spoke on the march on Washington at 19 years of age, intemperate, radical, out of control? They wanted to censor his speech. But before he spoke at the March on Washington, at 17 and in high school, he wrote letter after letter after letter after letter to one old man by the name of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In the movement, you need everybody, the elders and those who are younger. And if by chance in this effort, you grow discouraged. I want to leave you with these words, which are written on a piece of faded parchment entombed in the rare book library on the campus of Yale University and written on the hearts of millions of supporters of the NAACP. The words would be these. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. 
Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on. Let us march on. Let us march on. Let us march on. Let us march on till victory is won. Questions from the audience? Whatever happened to Middle's uh, flag? Did someone carry it the rest of the way? God bless you for asking that. So we did. We carried Middle's flag all the way into Washington. And we reached out to Senator Mark Warner because we wanted his flag flown over the U.S. Capitol. And there are a few rules about that. You can't fly flags that aren't issued by Congress. And we, uh, we, uh, we skirted around that little rule. And so on the day that the Pope spoke, we flew his flag over the Capitol. And then we flew the flag with an NAACP flag to his little town in Colorado. And we gave it to his widow and met all these wonderful people that he grew up with. And uh, if you go online, if you type in the word Middle Passage in the NAACP, you'll see his story. A uh, really beautiful, beautiful black man. Yeah. I encourage you to do that. Um. In terms of activism, what were the things you were participating in while you were in high school yourself? Yeah, good. It's a good question. Um, so in my, in my high school in South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina, uh, we had a number of um, challenges. Uh, we had two high schools in my town, uh, one for black students, one for white students. This is after the days of official segregation, but they deemed the black school uh, vocational and the white school college prep. And they made it difficult for black students to attend the um, white school. I did. Uh, we had a number of issues in terms of the way people were treated. Like I was listening to some of the students. I mean, I had on the first day, I took a honors history class. The teacher informed me that um, you're here because of affirmative action. You have the lowest grades of anybody in this class, and uh, you don't deserve to be here. And uh, as it turns out, that wasn't true, um, but that was the kind of environment that, that um, I went to school in. So we did things like we wrote uh, letters to the editor. We challenged uh, the, the administration with respect to how black students were treated, how the athletes were treated, like our af black athletes, um, they weren't getting scholarships to college like white athletes were. So um, I engaged in a little agitation. Uh, I think one of you, uh, was responsible for writing letters to the paper and publishing them. Uh, we did that, and uh, as a consequence, one of my classmates got kicked out for something I wrote. So I know a little something about this. Yeah. And in college, I, I did a lot of other things like that. What is the toughest challenge you've overcome as president of the NAACP? Mm. That's a wonderful question. I think the toughest challenge we face is that in some ways we have several NAACPs in one organization. So because we are the largest organization for, for civil rights for young people, we have about 2.3 million digital activists. So we have the kind of Twitter, Instagram, Periscope people, and then you got the Facebook folks and the people who don't do social media at all. 
Sometimes getting everybody to work together is a challenge. So in other words, when you have some folks who tweet and post all the time with other people who say, what is a tweeter in the same organization? So it's really a challenge of, uh, in terms of bringing everyone together. But one of the things that we believe to be so powerful is when you have everyone together. Because some of the older folks have the policy chops. They, have the, they know the governor. They know the mayor. They know the attorney general. And the millennial activists have what, what you would say in business is you, know, you have certain disruptive technologies the same way that Uber and Lyft are disruptive to, to, to old style taxis, millennials are kind of the disruptive technology to the movement, meaning they're upending, they're uh, turning assumptions on their head, they're bringing in uh, new insights in terms of intersectionality. And so what we want to do in, in the NAACP is we want to take advantage of neo old school techniques in terms of technology and organizing, but we want to be disruptive at the same moment. That's a hard trick to pull off, but we're trying it. Um, there's been a serious sort of conversation about the NAACP being identified with the black elite. Mm -hmm. um, and so my first question is sort of, well, how do you can respond to that um, and hopefully change within that? Um, and then I actually have also a second question about, is there any work within the NAACP within food justice and sort of food insecurity and responding to that? Sure, excellent question, excellent. So in terms of the NAACP being uh, an elite organization, here's what I would note. Let's look at the charter school debate, right? The NAACP called for a moratorium on the expansion of charter schools, not the elimination, the expansion, uh, based upon concerns about accountability, uh, the disparate discipline when it comes to, to particularly black boys. This, more, this resolution was passed by 2,000 delegates, mostly public school teachers, police officers, firefighters, carpenters, plumbers, not hedge fund managers, not education lobbyists. We are a very grassroots organization. When I say very grassroots, in the NAACP, we have lots of working class people. And so like, and, and, and let me just make something clear that might not be completely clear. Yeah, I went to Yale Law School. I guess did fairly well, but also graduated from a HBCU and Head Start. So, uh, you know, the NAACP is pretty grounded in the realities of, of the African American experience. Now, that being said, in terms of uh, food insecurity, one of our challenges is in, in many of our communities, like I worked for, in Newark for close to seven years, uh, the absence of grocery stores, the absence of fresh produce. So one of the things that we, we've worked on through our health initiative is working with uh, city governments to get financing for stores that want to, want to and are encouraged to um, uh, open and operate in food deserts. So we've done that. We've worked on the financing end of things. We've worked on the legislative end of things. And we've worked with the business community. And so that's a, that's a high priority for us. But like a great many things, frankly, the policing issues and the voting rights issues are what you see on CNN. But most of our work has to do with things you never see on television. And that's the work that we do day in and day out. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, I have a question about how the NAACP is dealing with activism post-election and your recommendations for us as well. Um, there is a lot of increased activism um, as a result of the recent uh, presidential election. And you know, as a Princeton student, I've seen that increase. But at the same time, when you move off of a university campus or this very protected environment, there are so many people um, who are so scared that they are not coming out and being active. Um, whether it's as a result of the threat of hate crimes or the threat of prejudice across society. So when you're trying to get these voices who are at the margins to you know, help um, become empowered and uh, find their voice to speak and that advocacy from within, 
Um, how is the NAACP kind of changing their structure and strategy to deal with this? And do you have any recommendations for us? Sure. So one of the things that we saw in the last election, note this. So we saw generationally unprecedented activism, but we also saw depressed turnout at the polls. So in other words, in, for example, in 2012, Afri women, predominantly African-American women and millennials led the vote. Then in 2016, we saw this precipitous drop off. And in 2014, the lowest turnout among millennials ever. So our endeavor has been since the election to, con to connect policy, protests, polls, and pop culture. Okay, what do we mean by that? You gotta connect what's happening in the streets with what should happen at the ballot box. So in other words, every, every protest mobilization, every protest organization becomes civic mobilization. Not in a, any partisan way, but we are literally trying to connect the energy in the streets with energy around the polls. So in other words, when you, when you organize a demonstration, you collect those names, you collect those addresses, you get you grow your list, and you move those people in terms of polls. That is key. It's also key for us to connect it with pop culture. Here's the challenge. If elections are just about what politicians do, then what, what is the role of citizens? So what we are trying to do at the end of the ACP is have those folks in the streets determine the agenda that we uh, bring to the polls in terms of policy. But we also connect it to pop culture. So for example, Chance the Rapper partnered with the NAACP on our civic mobilization efforts. So we were registering 1,000 students in a night at his concerts. But what we saw in the election was we just didn't have enough resources. So following this election, we're literally trying to mobilize more in the streets, connect that with a voter mobilization strategy, connect it with pop culture, and connect it with policy. In other words, we've got to know what we're talking about. When we say we're against police misconduct, we got to be able to speak to uh, civilian review boards with subpoena power. We got to be able to speak about body cameras. We got to be able to speak about consent decrees. We got to be able to speak about the, ro the proper role of the attorney general. We have to know what we're talking about, which is why I'm so excited about this group of scholar activists. Because here's reality. We got too many folks who are in the academy who are writing papers, but the scholarship, the research is not getting out to the streets. We got a generation of scholar activists who are doing a better job through social media of getting out the policy to the people who can use it. Okay? Mr. Brooks, I would like to pose a question that um, yesterday was posed to us by Vice President Durkee. Mm -hmm. And he asked us, in four years, where do you see race relations? Do you see them improving, stagnating, or deteriorating? And I'm just you know, curious sure. about your perspective. That's a, Thank you. That's, that's a tough question. Here's where I would know. I see race relations as becoming more volatile, um, more fraught with tension, but ultimately improving. Here's what we're seeing right now. Yes, hate crimes have gone up. Yes, there's a lot of division in our citizenry. But we're seeing at this moment coalitions, people coming together in ways we haven't seen before. So you remember when um, those young people were slain at the Pulse nightclub in, in Florida? I went to a Southern Baptist church in Orlando. And you had the NAACP, you had a human rights campaign, you had LGBTQ activists and conservative clergy standing together against hate. We're seeing that. We're seeing the environmentalists and civil rights folk and good government folk coming together. We're seeing millennials and, and pre-millennials coming together. This is a moment where if we take advantage of this tragic opportunity, where we're being forced to work together as a consequence of the crush of circumstance. We can come out of this better, but it's gonna be difficult. It's gonna take a lot of organization. It's gonna take a serious focus on policy because what we've had quite often is, is an expression of outrage in the streets, 
but an insufficient attention to policy behind closed doors. You gotta have both. You cannot have a clinical, detached, dispassionate view to people being brutalized in the streets, but you also cannot have only outrage. Hello. I have two questions, but I don't want to ask them at the same time, so I'm going to ask it, and then you can answer, and then I'm going to ask the other one, because they're not related, okay? Cool. So the first one is, I feel like there's, in the black community, like in the black activist grassroots community, there's a lot of mistrust between the NAACP and um, reverends who were pr prominent during the civil rights movement because of co-opting and um, just like different tactics in like one-sided respect. So how do you, do you think that this is something to be combated? Do you see the NAACP being able to work with like grassroots, radical, like abolitionist organizations and how would that be possible? So the answer to the question is uh, yes and yes. Here's why. We are already seeing that. So, for example, one of the largest demonstrations in Atlanta, you remember when you had the, um, uh, you had Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, the police officers killed in Dallas in a row of tragedy, okay? In Atlanta, we had a massive demonstration with Black Lives Matter activists and the Atlanta branch of the NAACP organizing together, okay? okay? In, the, in those demonstrations, you had the police engage, you had the, the, the mayor engaged, no one was hurt, the message was sent, and the message was not compromised. We have seen that in places around the country, but here's the challenge. The challenge is, it's a better story. It's more interesting if on the news, they can get me to say, those young radicals are out of control, those young radicals are about violence, those young radicals don't have a message. But if you notice, we don't do that. We don't do it because the history of the NAACP is one in which we have brought together all kinds of folk who uh, might not be in the same room. You recall that the NAACP was started by a majority of white progressives with a man by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois reassuring the black progressives that the white progressives would not, be, uh, would not get out of control. So this was, a, this was a, a coalition with all kinds of ideological divides, differences of philosophy, but our common commitment to a, with a love and affection for our people. And so I believe that when you have a love and affection for all people, and can I say particularly black people, we cannot allow the investment bankers and radicals to ignore the fact that, listen, when you get pulled over on the side of the road, Outside these pinstripes, you look like anybody else. And inside these pinstripes, you look like anybody else. And I can tell you for a fact, uh, with my Yale Law degree, with uh, clerkship, I have been stopped more times on the New Jersey Turnpike than I can count. I've had a police officer pull a gun on me because I reached for my glasses without giving him notice. We've got to emphasize the, com the commonality of our humanity. And be, and, and be serious about the fact that when you have a young black man being 21 times more likely to lose his life at the hands of the police than his white counterpart, what difference does your, uh, your uh, uh, neo-bourgeois philosophy compared to somebody else's radical philosophy compared to someone's DLC philosophy compared to someone's Republican, Democrat, or otherwise philosophy with that reality? When I, just last point here. When I met Philando Castile's mother, after she lost her son, and you got a group of, as you put it, ministers around her, she's comforting us. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about who was a member of NAN, who was a member of Urban, Urban League, the NAACP, or whatever group. We were grieving over the loss of somebody's son. That's what the movement is about. Right. The rest of that is a sideshow. That's true, I agree. Sorry, you, okay. you had a second question. Mm -hmm. My other thing is, um, W.E.B. Du Bois was also about, like he had a theory that like, um, 
yeah, like there needs to be improvement. Like we have to, we have to be advanced, and that's why he found the NAACP. But he was also like, there are certain types of Black people who will be able to acquire that. Like we have to uplift certain ones in which we deem worthy of that um, through education, or like, like for example, we we don't want leaders who um, who are on welfare or something, like everything that happened with Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks. We talk about Rosa Parks, but the NAACP had a role in silencing Claudette Colvin. So I'm wondering if current, like present day, does the NAACP believe in respectability politics and perpetuate that? To, to, you know your history well, very well. We absolutely committed to respecting the wisdom, the intelligence, the leadership ability of all of our people and not devolving into respectability politics is either means or goal, means or ends. In other words, we're not trying to cr create a society in which everybody who rises to a certain level of respectability has equal access and equal opportunity, or are we only willing to use those folks who meet our respectability politics standard to get there. And I would, simply, I would simply say to you that we can't afford that. So we're not trying to model that. Uh, in other words, we're trying to work with anyone who wants to work with us uh, in terms of seeking justice. And in the course of the last three years, certainly we've tried to, not perfectly, reach out and broaden coalitions. And I can tell you, like in our demonstrations in, um, in Virginia, we made it a point to do a sit-in with high school students. I said, I don't need the branch president, you can speak. We want the youth council to be out front. You do the interviews. You talk about voter suppression. We've also tried to be mindful of the fact that we don't want just lawyers speaking. We don't want everybody to have a PhD. We want the full breadth and the depth of the community to speak. So your point is well taken. Uh, we don't do it perfectly, we're trying to do it better.
Just uh, thank you so much. The New Jersey State Conference of the NAACP and the local branch, uh, I didn't know you were here, so thank you. And um, as many of you may know, the NAACP has youth councils and college chapters. And if there's not a youth council where you, I mean, if there's not a high school uh, chapter where you are, you can start one. Uh, you can start one in college. We always, always, always welcome uh, your leadership. And as I like to tell people, when it, we're not asking people to join the NAACP, we're asking you to lead in the NAACP. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey. Yeah. It was me? Uh, oh, hi. My bad. I thought it was someone else. Um, so me and some other people at my school just recently watched the uh, movie on Netflix, 13th. And yeah. her comment kind of reminded me of a question that was like up inside of us that we didn't really know how to answer. And it was, because they talked about um, the Black Panthers and the, the KKK and things like that. Not a lot, but you know, it was in there. Um, and a the question we had was, why is the KKK not considered a terrorist group? But then you have groups like the NWA who were seen as the most dangerous group in the world and things like that. So I just wanted to know your thoughts. Sure. Well, the, the Ku Klux Klan may not be seen by some <laughs> as a terrorist organization. It's certainly uh, seen by us uh, as a terrorist organization. And I don't mean back in the day. So only six, seven months ago, we had in our, at our Houston branch of the NAACP, on a Sunday morning, a group of white nationalists showed up with M16s, AK-47s, um, uh, Confederate flags, and white nationalist regalia uh, at our headquarters. And to show you the connection between the NAACP and the, and the movement for black lives, the reason they showed up at our headquarters is because they said the NAACP should have checked the movement for black lives. And that because we failed to, quote, check them, they were going to protest against us. Now, we, of course, declined their request. They are, in fact, a terrorist organization. And when you look at the, the, the literature of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and you look at the number of hate crimes that they've engaged in over the, over the decades, it's real. So let, 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 let's think about this. The Klan in the 1920s, in terms of a threat, um, started off in the wake of uh, the Klan of the Reconstruction Era uh, at a relative handful, grew to well over two million based on three factors. And I want you to note this, because they, they're probably familiar with it, familiar to you. One, an anti-immigrant sentiment. Two, a false pseudo-narrative with respect to Christianity, right? And three, uh, a kind of thin patriotism. Now, if we think about what's going on in the country right now, this is not a partisan com observation, it is simply a sociological observation. There's an anti-immigrant sentiment, there's this notion of, of making uh, America great at any expense. Again, just a, this is just not a partisan observation, but just an observation. Um, and this notion that certain people have, have a monopoly on the truth, i.e., I'm, I'm Christian, I have a Christian view of the world, and that excludes Muslims, it excludes people in the LGBT community, it excludes all kinds of folk. This is a toxic and dangerous brew. The Klan is a terrorist organization. The, the Klan's influence it manifests itself in different ways through different organizations now. But we got to be vigilant. We got to be real clear about this. And I've, I can tell you, on social media, there's certain things you can say, and within seconds, you're going to get a lot of hate from them. We know this. Okay. Okay, we're going to have two more questions. Me again. From what you were saying earlier, um, and you were saying about uh, starting your own chapters, your own chapters at different colleges and whatnot. How would or schools, high schools? How would one go about doing that? Like, you know, how does it get that done? Easy. So reach out to our youth and college division, uh, and or your state conference. You can send an email to Stephen Green, uh, S Green at naacpnet.org. Uh, about starting a college chapter, you can reach out to your state conference and find them online. 
Um, we are seeing an explosion of growth. I mean, we uh, are signing up new college chapters. Uh, people are joining in a month. Our membership numbers, mostly young, going up by two, three hundred percent. Um, because frankly, people want to start their own. They want to do something different. And so, even if you uh, don't start a chapter, going to an NAACP branch and going with ideas, uh, bringing your ideas in terms of new initiatives. We need to do that because we've got to be clear about this. The threats we face are real. They're very real. And we need uh, activists, not just for your energy, that's great. But we need your ideas, right? Because um, I can tell you, this, uh, they're those who are standing against the kinds of reform that w reforms that we seek. When they see you in the streets, they see you online, they think twice about what they're trying to do. So we just reach out to us. More than happy to connect you with the right folks. I'm sorry. Can you just restate the email you just said out loud, please? <laughs> yeah. So S as in Stephen, green as in the color, at naacpnet.org. So S green at NAACP net.org and then every state has a state conference you can always reach out to them uh, but the youth and college division that's what they do and it's on the the NAACP website but we really really uh, encourage you to do that and if I can just share with you if you think about the last few years um, on the campus of Yale the students engaged in some pretty significant protests brought about a 30 million dollar commitment by by the university to diversify the curricula, diversify uh, training. Uh, they renamed two, I should say, named two residential colleges, one after a woman I hope everybody knows, Paulie Murray. Paulie Murray, who was a, an Episcopal priest, a civil rights lawyer. This was a black woman who laid the groundwork for Brown versus Board of Education, note this, as a student. Her professors, she told her professors, we can destroy Jim Crow inside of a generation. They laughed at her. Then Thurgood Marshall took the book that she turned her term paper into, which was the Bible of state desegregation laws, and they destroyed Jim Crow. She did that as a student. The new residential college at Yale is being named after her and Ben Franklin, uh, and that's a consequence of student advocacy, including the Yale branch of the Yale chapter of the NAACP. University of Missouri, they have a new chancellor as a consequence of the advocacy of that chapter. My point being here is you got power. Use it. Thank you. One more. One more. I was wondering where, where you think the place of public policy and you know, government action is in social movements versus you know, being on the streets and advocacy. It, it's, it's incredibly important. So like one lesson from history. So we recall that in Selma that Martin Luther King and uh, his band of civil rights activists took three attempts to cross the bridge. It only a few dozen people made the whole march. It was only the last march that was large. That was in 1965. The Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. So they engaged in the street level activism. They, re they used, as someone noted earlier, the media, right? But they also gathered back in Washington at a place called the Reform Action Center, uh, which is basically the policy arm of the reform rabbis. And in that building in Washington, they wrote the Voting Rights Act. So policy and protest are connected. You need folks who are focused on policy, focused on the law, doing the research, doing the analysis, doing what you do so well and so intuitively, right? The scholarship connected with the street level activism and energy. If you have policy without energy, basically you have ideas unimplemented. If you have uh, energy without the policy, you have expression of outrage without outcome. We need both. And 
This is a moment where, thank goodness, we have scholar activists who get that. That's you.